I'm Clayton Cheever, the Assistant Director at the Thomas Crane Public Library. Uh, this is made possible by the Friends of the Thomas Crane Library. Um, they're a wonderful organization. If you're not familiar with Quincy or the Thomas Crane Library, I encourage you to check out our website at thomascranelibrary.org. Um, you can learn all about us and you can learn about the Friends in the lower left of that website uh, where you can find out all about the Friends and even become a friend yourself if you'd like to help support programs like this. Um, you can become a friend for as little as $10 a year. And they run a bookstore for us when the building can be open. Um, but even though they can't run the bookstore in these times, uh, they can. Um, they, they very much support us in the work that we do uh, and help make us help us bring programs like this to you. So check out our calendar, thomascranelibrary.org. Uh, please support the friends and enjoy the program tonight. I will be watching the chat stream on the YouTube video as best as I can, um, but there are a lot of people here, so I'm sure we're not going to be able to get to everybody's questions. Um, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce everyone to Sean Murphy. We had a great program with him a couple weeks ago, uh, looking at the implications of Brexit on Ireland, um, in which I encourage you to go out. You can find it here on our YouTube channel. Um, he teaches much longer courses. Something I want to say, there's been some confusion, I think, uh, people going into this thinking that we were going to be doing a, you know, a full maybe doctorate level uh, seminar on Irish history. That's not what you're going to get tonight. Uh, and I'm sure Sean will set us straight, but we only have a limited time together. And we're going to start with the last ice age and come up to present date. So you may want to strap your seatbelts on. If you wore good socks, you might want to take them off right now because they're going to get knocked off um, in, the, in the process. That's all for me. I'm going to get out of the way and just let Sean take the stage. Thanks for joining us. Sean, the floor is yours. Uh, so as Clayton said, uh, this is not uh, by any means, uh, you know, uh, doctorate. It's intended to be open to everybody. But what it is, is an attempt in an hour uh, to go through Irish history from beginning to end. So the only thing I can say about it, it's, it's one of those things that you shouldn't try at home. And it's going to be a bit topsy-turvy. I'm going to go back to, and I'm going to start with the ancient geological history of Ireland. And then I'm going to proceed down through the arrival of the first peoples uh, to Ireland. And then get to the point where the Celts came in, uh, where Christianity arrived, the Vikings, uh, the English. Uh, so everybody who's come to Ireland I'll be addressing. So you get a, an overall picture. And I'll be looking at general themes like the, uh, you know, the introduction of farming, uh, you know, Christianity, uh, the confiscations and the destruction of the ancient Gaelic society that was here for over 3000 years. And I'm going to be finishing up with the uh, War of Independence. So I'm going to do this as a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so I'm going to share the screen and I just asked uh, Clayton to make sure that uh, it comes across to you. So I'm starting off on the first page here with just some of the names for Ireland. Uh, the first three are uh, 20th century, Ireland era, Republic of Ireland. Uh, the Hibernian name, known as Aaron and Scotia. So as I said, from start to finish, so put on your seatbelts. Uh, I was going to play some music here. It's, it's a beautiful one. Uh, also, Clayton, if people let you know, I can send them a copy of this presentation. If you ever get a chance to watch this, it's by the Chieftains, and it's called O'Sullivan's March, and it's about the uh, O'Sullivan's March from Vera uh, after the Battle of Kinsale in the early 17th century uh, when they were forced to take off and march uh, about 150 miles up to, uh, I think it was County Leitrim, um, a lot of people died on the way. So uh, anyway, so here's a, a, a general statement that covers it all. The Ireland we know today was a geological accident forged between two continents and then frozen, dumped beneath warm seas, lifted in part to the heights of the Himalayas, covered with lush tropical, tropical swamps, blistering deserts and vast expanses of molten rock. And again, buried under ice and finally thawed out. And as far as we know, after that, people arrived. Uh, here's the oldest part of Ireland. It's a piece uh, off the coast of Donegal, and it's, uh, it's aged at 1.7 billion years old. Uh, right here in the middle, if you can see uh, if where I'm pointing to, that's a, an old lighthouse. And it's called Inish Trotal off Donegal coast. It's just the oldest piece, 1.7 billion years ago. So just a couple of things, in case you're not aware, the Earth is estimated to be about 4.6 billion years old. And essentially what we have 
in Ireland, we had two chunks of land that floated around the Earth's surface for millions of years before being welded together about 400 million years ago. Uh, for the first couple of billion years, all you had here was molten rock and gases. And, and eventually, probably as a result of something happen, happening on the sun, uh, a crust began to form and eventually uh, things changed so that there was a surface. Uh, from time to time, uh, all of the land areas will come together. I think they'll come together about three times and they'll be all together again in about another 250 million years. But that's something I'll talk about later. Uh, so Ireland happened then because two, what you might call paleo or old continents collided and they squeezed two small land masses together. And then when they separated, uh, what was left uh, was Ireland, but again, it wouldn't have been in the shape that it is today. The oldest rock I've just shown you, 1.7 billion years. Now, older rocks may yet be found. Some older rocks obviously eroded, uh, turned into dust. Uh, some were melted by the heat. Some were encased in lava and metamorphosed into new rocks. Uh, here's one, and just taking into account again, the map of Ireland has changed, you know, over the billions of years. So down here on the left hand side, it's just a, a picture just to get across the idea that Ireland uh, was two parts to begin with. And they were on the in the southern hemisphere. Uh, and at one point, Dublin and Belfast, if you like, were 3000 miles apart. Uh, and over time, because, as I said, the surface of the earth is uh, floating. Uh, so the parts of Ireland have moved gradually and about 300 million years ago, they headed over the equator and they're up there uh, where we see them uh, to, today. And that just gives you a bit of an idea of what, what has happened. Now, here's um, uh, again around 450 to 480 million years ago. I'm going to point out to you where Ireland was. Now, down here, uh, there's a little red spot here and a little red spot down here. The one on the top is where this little piece here represents parts of Scotland and northwestern Ireland. Down here then you had England, Wales and the southeast of Ireland. Then about 50 million years later, uh, this part here began to move across and eventually they met up and they were squeezed together as, as the big continents here came closer and merged into one. And the middle part of Ireland, which isn't represented by this, uh, was, was created uh, by a, a, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, I suppose, a, a process that I haven't really got time to go into here. But these were identifiably parts of Ireland 450 to 480 million years ago. So sometimes we refer to it as a geological marriage. And it occurred when both land masses had reached a position at that time, it, they were still south of the equator in the mid-Pacific between what is now Australia and South America. Uh, so there was a collision, in fact, of three continents, two of which contained portions of Ireland. There were Avalonia, Laurentia and Baltica, and they formed a, a new continent, Laurentia, uh, that housed the future North American and European uh, Euro-Asia Euro continents. So the United Plate then lay in southern latitudes at about the level of uh, South Africa today, and it, they moved uh, about, since it was unified, it's moved about 5,500 miles. So during the next three to 400 million years, Ireland was carried slowly northwest. Uh, it, it's generally the surface of the earth is moving a couple of centimeters a year. Um, so the, the only problem is it doesn't always move in one direction. You know, so it can move forward and backwards. Uh, and you can do the math for yourself. If Ireland had been moving forward uh, at, at the rate of a couple of centimetres a year uh, for the last uh, 1.7 billion years, it would be a lot further away. It would have rotated the earth a few times. So from the initial quote I gave you, we know that Ireland has experienced being submerged, sometimes totally, being an arid desert, having mountains the size of the Himalayas, covered by up to two miles of ice, sometimes an island, and sometimes connected to the European continent. Now, by about 25 million years ago, Ireland was close to assuming its present position. From then on, a long period of erosion resulted in considerable uh, soil formation that covered most of the bedrock. As the climate cooled, then the soil formation slowed down and a, flor a flora and a fauna that would millions of years later be familiar to the first human inhabitants began to emerge. 
uh, and the present landscape of Ireland had more or less uh, formed. But the dunking, you know, going under seas and uh, being covered in ice, uh, that hadn't finished. So the Ice Age then, uh, roughly, sometimes we talk about 1.7 million years or 1 million years, but there's been as many as six periods of ice advance, followed by ice retreats in continental Europe. Each period lasted about 100,000 years, alternating with warmer periods, average from, averaging from 10 to 60,000 years. Now, when temperatures gradually rose again, the ice began to melt Glaciers retreated, dumping ground up rocks as clay. Uh, so in terms of the future, so extrapolating the current course of continental drift, it gives a picture 250 million years from now where the Atlantic Ocean has vanished and the continents again reassembled into a single supercontinent. Ireland will be abutting Newfoundland and, a, and in a position further north than Scandinavia. So that's just a rough introduction to the geological history of Ireland. Uh, again, there was a, a brilliant report done by the Geological Survey in Ireland from which I got a lot of my information. And I have a lot of maps from that, but I don't have time to show them to you here. But I, I can reference that report for you. So let's talk about people then. Now, the Mesolithic area a period and the Neolithic period, they, they tend to change from, you know, from place to place because uh, the, the first period is identified as the period uh, where we had hunter-gatherers. And in Ireland, that covers a period 12,500 to 6,000 years ago. In other parts of the world where they didn't have the same issue with ice, uh, hunter-gatherers were uh, around for a long, long time before that. And it's conceivable that they were in Ireland as well before the last ice age. We just don't know. Now, during the, the most recent uh, quaternary glaciations, two and a half million years ago to today, ice sheets more than 9,800 feet thick scoured the landscape of Ireland, pulverizing rock and bone and eradicating any possible evidence of early human settlements. Uh, positive evidence of human settlement in Ireland begins about 12 and a half thousand years ago. You mentioned there was somebody from Clare. They may be familiar with the cave here, uh, the Gwendolyn Cave in County Clare. So radio carbon dating of a butchered brown bare knee uh, bone that was done in 2016, the bone was found in 1903, uh, gives us undisputed evidence that people existed in Ireland during the preceding Paleolithic period. So what you, you look for is evidence of habitation, evidence of tools, um, and then evidence of things like bones, where it is clear uh, that uh, a humans had worked on those bones, you know, from the cuttings that would be on them. They're, they're the kind of evidence that you would be looking for. Uh, that established the humans were on the island of Ireland uh, 12,500 years ago, and that was 2,500 earlier than previous previously believed. Uh, the bones, in fact, had been stored in the National Museum for about 100 years before they were dated. So here's a, um, uh, the first piece of human habitation, um, and it's a model, and it's a model of the Mount Sandal Hut in County Derry that dates back to 9,000 9, years ago. You can get an idea of the scale there. There's two figures of uh, humans uh, there around it. So that gives you an idea of what the overall size would be. Also, in terms of hard evidence of people, well, recently discovered the remains of two individuals in County Limerick whose bones have been dated between 7200 and 6500 BC. There's also the cremated remains of an adult male who was interred with a polished stone axe and two flint blades. Um, it is believed that the population of Ireland during the, um, the uh, Mesolithic period or the, the Stone Age period uh, from, you know, 12,500 to, say, around 6,000, it was probably at a maximum of around 8,000. Now, the Neolithic uh, is defined essentially as the New Stone Age, and the main issue, main, the main thing that differentiates it there is that it's the beginning of the farming age. And here's a quote I came across. Um, because again, we don't know who they were, and I'll be going through that in a moment. So this is a quote, a, a so far unidentified coastal population in Britain or the continent, setting out in boats to establish their farms in Ireland at an unverified date and for reason, and for reason unknown. So we're talking about a period here of about 1500 years, uh, and then we get into the Bronze Age. 
So some historians call the transition from hunter gathering to farming is the most profound revolution in human history. It was more than change in the economy because it also brought major changes in technology, in society and religion. Uh, and in some cases, its introduction brought about major changes to the linguistic and genetic, uh, genetic composition of the people. Uh, so the appearance, uh, you know, of the Neolithic people in Ireland, it's marked by major changes. Uh, one of them would have been, you would now have Mesolithic campsites uh, being replaced by settlements of one to three solidly built timber houses. Uh, because houses now are going to be used year round, uh, distinguishing them from the nomadic Mesolithic people. And here's an example of what one would have looked like. This is a reconstruction in a place near Cookstown in County Tyrone. This is a Neolithic house on the crown of a hill. Um, it was discovered in 1965 following bulldozing of the site. Uh, pottery and flint was unearthed when the area had been dug up and that prompted the area to be excavated and the Neolithic settlement was found. And that's the reconstruction there, uh, something that was built uh, around 3125 BC, uh, over 5,000 years ago. Now, in terms of the origin of the Irish, uh, the, there's a couple, of, a couple of things that people take as the kind of starting point, and this is probably one of them. So from, from a biological point of view, the Neolithic population of, of Ireland, whatever its origin, provide a baseline for defining the genetic origins of the Irish people. The big question is to what extent uh, the Neolithic population was the product of the local Mesolithic population or the result of totally new colonists coming to Ireland. And we really don't know. Um, so a lot of you may have heard of Newgrange, and I know anyone who has thought that was a long time ago, but from what I've told you already, Newgrange is relatively recent. Um, so that's what it looks like. It was made about uh, 3200 BC, a little over 5200 years ago. Um, it's, a, it's a marvel of engineering, mathematics, uh, understanding of uh, engineering. So it's a Neolithic monument in the Boyne Valley. Uh, it's older than Stonehenge and the Egyptian pyramids. And as you saw, it's a large circular mound literally uh, chimney, uh, kidney shaped uh, with a stone passageway and chambers inside. So I'm gonna play this for you. Out of the mists of the stone age, this structure has stood since the dawn of recorded history. This rounded tomb called Newgrange has stood on the bend of Ireland's River Boyne for more than 5,000 years. It is massive, distinct, and very mysterious. The mound of earth covers a rock passageway, which leads to a central chamber where the ashes and bones of the dead were placed. Long thought to be just a tomb, in the late 1960s, archeologists uncovered an amazing secret that shed new light on this ancient structure. On the winter solstice, the longest night and shortest day of the year, a shaft of light enters a perfectly positioned window and lights up the 60-foot corridor that leads to the basin of ancestral bones. An impressive feat of engineering, considering its Stone Age builders possessed only rudimentary technologies. It's particularly important because it's been proven without doubt that it was very deliberately aligned to sunrise of the winter solstice. Its facade is of white quartz restored by archaeologists who believe the mound was originally covered in a smooth stone that reflected the light. The massive stones in the interior were perhaps pulled from the river. The builders probably moved the boulders into position by rolling them on logs. Archaeologists believe it took decades to construct Newgrange. And since life expectancy was short, only about 40 years, the project likely was handed down from generation to the next. Little is known about the Neolithic farming community that created this structure. Why they built it is still a mystery. Perhaps the mound was a place of worship. Historians admit they just don't know. 
we know they were used as burial places, but we also think they would have been used as places for ritual gatherings, where a focus for community gatherings, a um, place to honour the ancestors. For more than 5,000 years, Newgrange has captured the rising sun of the winter solstice. It's a lasting monument to human ingenuity and to a desire as old as mankind. Even then, people strove to understand great forces of nature and to harness them, even if only for a brief moment in time. Okay, so that's... Um there are people commenting, Sean, that they really, uh, that they have been to New Grange uh, and really enjoy it. And they were wondering if they can, if we can be visited. And people commented that if you want to go on winter solstice, you better get your tickets well in advance. It's a magical place. And, and in fact, there's no tickets. It's a, there's a lottery, so you have to enter the lottery and hope your name gets picked out. You can't buy a ticket or such. So the ancient. I'm going to move on now to the. Uh, the what might be called the ancient Irish history from the oral and the literary uh, tradition. Um, the book that I'm going to refer to right away is a book that was written uh, in the 10th to 11th century, Laura Gabala Aaron, which literally translates into the Book of Invasions or the booking, uh, Book of Takings. And it was written by monks um, and it relied upon uh, the old annals that were created you know, in the previous centuries by, by monks um, and also the available oral uh, tradition. What they tried to do, though, was they tried to write a history that um, used as a framework the Old Testament. Um, so from the, you know, from Ireland using the Old Testament, the world began around 5199. So, again, they, they tried then to take the recorded and the oral history of Ireland and tried to put dates on it that would match with significant uh, events within the uh, Christian tradition, which meant that, uh, you know, uh, people who were Mesolithic uh, would have been ignored because they couldn't have existed uh, or they would have brought them forward. So again, there was a certain selectivity in terms of, of that or else they just didn't know. And obviously, I mean, it's only in the last few hundred years uh, that um, we have moved beyond uh, creationism as a way, well, in, in certain parts of the world. Uh, there is a, a course that I do where I go through the, the origin stories, you know, for the different religions. Um, and if you go back through that, uh, you get uh, a range that the world began around four to 5,000 years ago, uh, up to 25 trillion years ago. Anyway, that's for another day's work. So according uh, to this work, Ireland was inhabited by seven successive tribes at various times in the prehistoric past. And because it was written uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the Old Testament, it had to relate back to the flood. So incredibly, the origins of all seven ancient tribes appear to trace all the way back to Noah. Um, now, the record comes uh, written in the late 11th and early 12th, and in this, the date of the flood uh, is the 24th century BC. Uh, there, are, there are other dates for the flood. Now, here's, um, again, in Ireland, there's local traditions, and this is one of them. And this is a tradition that uh, attempts to account for the first people that arrived in Ireland. And according to local folklore, the first foot was planted on Irish Isle at Dawnmark, which translates to the place of the boat, on the shores of Bantry Bay in 2680 BC. So uh, one of Noah's sons, Bit, had a daughter, uh, Césaire. She was denied admission to the ark. So she and her family built their own ships and they set sail looking for a land which knew no sin because it had never been populated. That was the logic. So they found a way to Ireland, a place they knew as Eru, and they disembarked at Dunamark, the place of the boat in County Cork, and apparently they landed on a Saturday, the 15th day of the moon. There is a single commemoration of this event, and it's in the National Learning Centre in County Cork. Um, now, there's a work of art there. It was made in 2013 by the students of the centre, 
and this is what it looks like here. It's called Voyage of Stories, um, and that there is a, a boat on a pond. Um, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a story of it. So what it does, the Voyage of Stories, it recalls that pioneering arrival in the form of, of a boat sculpture. It's made of steel, copper, and glass, and it's set up over a pool. Now, the glass tiles then tell of invasions and emigrations, both ancient and modern in Irish, uh, and in the Irish language and in English. So again, if you're ever down in Cork, uh, that would be an interesting place to go see. Also, you can search the web. So then we had the flood. So post-flood then, Césaire's group arrived with three men and a few dozen women. Uh, the men died off and, you know, that was it. As soon as the women died, that was the end of the colony. So the next to arrive were the Fomorian tribe, sometimes thought to be from Africa. Uh, and they were the first of the post-flood arrivals and they established a base uh, on the... Um, uh, Tory Island off the coast of Donegal. Here is uh, from the Book of Invasions. Uh, here are the five main Celtic tribes with their year of arrival. Uh, the Mwinchir Partelon, Mwinchir Nemed, the Firbolg, Tuatha Danann, and the Clan the Mila. They're all in Irish and there's the, the dates uh, here for you. Um, again, those dates are disputed. Uh, if you're reading, sometimes um, sometimes the uh, books you're reading, when going back that far, uh, they will either give you the dates as BC, but then there's others that will give you the time from the uh, you know from the beginning, from creation, from the time of creation, which again, as I said, can vary. It varies from around 4,000 to 5,500, but in the case of Ireland, the date seems to be 5199 or 5198 BC. Uh, so the arrival of the five Celtic tribes, well, these were the ancient Celtic tribes, descendants of Noah, through the lineage of his son, uh, Japheth. And all five tribes had strong ties with Scythia. It's a large region in central Eurasia. They all spoke a common language, the original Celtic language of Gaelic. <clears throat> so Ireland became a monarchy uh, at one point under the Fir Bullocks. They were the first to introduce a formal system of monarchy in Ireland. Um, they ruled Ireland for, I think it was 37 years. And again, it was very warlike in those days. So you didn't last around long. So in 37 years, we had nine, uh, nine high kings. And they had nine of the 150 high kings that ruled uh, Ireland from the royal hill of Tara. So under that system, you had a supreme monarch, you had regional kings who, along with their subjects, were governed entirely by the Ard Reen Heron, the High King of Ireland. The clan system, the clan system that they introduced, it was a system that would prevail for the next 3,100 years, uh, with some modifications by the people that came after them, the Tua de Danon and the Milesians. And then, obviously, we can talk about, you know, Christianity and the Vikings and the English. So, but... Uh, they were overpowered initially by the Tuatha Dé Danann, uh, who in turn then were overpowered by the Milesians. Um, and uh, apparently they turned to farming and shepherding. So let's have a look then at Clan the Mila, sometimes called the Milesians or the Gaelic race. And they're the ones that uh, essentially it is said that all Irish people originate uh, from. So the Milesians were the Gaels. When you talk about Gaels, uh, we're talking about the Milesians. They were the last of the great Celtic tribes to conquer Ireland, and according to the book of the takings or invasions, they arrived in 1699 BC. Again, depending upon the books you read, there's different dates for that, but it's, it's somewhere, give or take a few hundred years. Uh, their king, Milesius, or Mil Espana in Gaelic, himself an acclaimed warrior. He got his name having won a thousand battles. And as you know, Mila is the Gaelic word for thousand. Like Cade Mila Falta means a hundred thousand welcomes. So that's where the Mila comes from. Um, the Milesians had already colonized Portugal and much of Spain, including Galicia, uh, before conquering Ireland and from there, Scotland. Now, two of his sons, uh, Heber and Hemeron, uh, Hermann, along with his deceased son, Ear, became ancestors to all the Milesian Gaels of Ireland and Scotland. 
And between them, they reign supreme over all of Ireland, uh, not between Heber and Harriman, but all of their successors, because they set up the, blood, the bloodline for the future monarchs of Ireland. And to be recognized as a monarch, you had to be able uh, to identify your bloodline back to, uh, to any one of those three. Uh, the only one who broke with that tradition was Brian Baru. But that's another day's work to explain that to you. So anyway, between them all and their descendants, they reigned supreme over all of Ireland, almost unbroken for about 3,100 years before the English arrived and they had to uh, essentially surrender that and give that up to King Henry II in 1173. Now we'll move on quickly to Christianity and St. Patrick, which um, would be the next major turning point in Irish history. So in terms of early Christianity, well, you know, the, the, in terms of Europe, uh, the, Celts, the Celts were, uh, I suppose at one time, were the, the, largest, uh, the largest civilization in Europe. And eventually the Romans, uh, you know, began to develop and then there was wars going on between the Romans and the Celts and quite a number of the Celts that arrived in Ireland uh, would have been people who were dispossessed by the Romans in various parts, uh, various Celtic territories uh, on the continent. And one of the reasons that the Romans never managed to take Ireland was because the Celts in Ireland understood the nature of their enemy and they made sure that the Romans didn't get a foothold uh, in, in Ireland. Um, and Irish mercenaries would have fought the Romans. Um, they would have, uh, high kings, one of, the, one of the powers that high kings had was that they could raise an army to get an income by basically providing mercenaries. Uh, most of the time they would have sent them you know, to fight against the, the Romans. It is said um, that a, a senior military figure of, uh, Conor Magnessa uh, was present at the crucifixion um, when he came home and when he told Conor Magnessa, apparently Conor went insane and died on hearing of Christ's crucifixion. Apparently um, Conor had been in a fight at some stage or other and he'd got a piece of metal uh, stuck in his head that couldn't be removed. <clears throat> and when he heard about the crucifixion, he ran out of the room he was in shouting and screaming and jumping up and down and the piece of metal dislodged and kill them. A few centuries later, then, one of the greatest uh, high kings, or is recognized as one of the greatest and wisest of high kings, he apparently was poisoned by the Druids because he had converted to Christianity. And I'm just going through this to kind of help you to understand why the old story you would have been told that St. Patrick brought Christianity to Ireland uh, isn't, isn't uh, the full picture. Um, before Patrick arrived, uh, St. James and St. John had uh, quite a bit of influence and they had quite a bit of influence uh, for, you know, for hundreds of years after Patrick, uh, you know, was gone. They were a different tradition than Peter and Paul. Peter and Paul kind of represented, if you like, just crudely putting it. Peter and Paul equates with Rome, uh, <clears throat> James and John with the uh, uh, Middle East and uh, parts of Africa. And uh, the two most famous names in Ireland are, if any of you know, Seamus and Sean. Well, Seamus is James and John is Sean. So there's a, a kind of a common sense link there. But when it came to things like the dating of Easter, the Irish went with, the, with James and John on that. And also in terms of the, the tonsure. Uh, the tonsure is the haircut. And believe it or not, there was a time when people would go to war over a haircut. Um, so anyway... Also, uh, just to uh, elaborate on the point about St. Patrick and uh, him not being the first to bring Christianity, uh, there's a number of early Irish saints that are recognized, St. Albi, Declan, Abban, and Ciaran. They were all active before Patrick ever came. A little bit about him. And again, if you read the literature, you will find people who will, it goes from one extreme to the other. Uh, there are some people who say there never was a St. Patrick uh, there's some people who said there was two of them, and then timelines will 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 differ. But these are the timelines that I go with. Uh, well, the first one anyway that he was born around 386 on the west coast of Britain. We're not too sure whether it was Wales or whether it was Scotland. 
um, and he died uh, probably in 462, um, but there are other dates, uh, 492 and 493 as well, that uh, could possibly be true, but that would have made him very old. Now, the only thing about dying old in those days, and there were a number of uh, saints that died, coincidentally, at the age of 120. Because in the Bible, apparently, if you died at 120, that kind of confirmed your status as, uh, as, as, uh, as, as close to God as you could be. Anyway, he, he, Patrick wrote a number of, book, uh, number of uh, works. And one was, the, uh, one, one, one was um, it's the closest thing to an autobiography. It's titled The Confessio. And in that, he identifies the place that he was born in as Manaventa, Bernia. Uh, but no one has ever been able to... Uh, you know, to manage to figure out exactly where that was. His name was Maywin Sucat Patricius, and in Latin it was Maganus Sucatus Patricius. Uh, and again, uh, what a lot of people don't know is that many of his siblings and relatives uh, came uh, to Ireland, and I do uh, a course on, uh, on his siblings, the most important being um, his sister Dererka, who's known as the mother of saints. She gave birth to 20 children. Uh, most of them ended up, you know, as a... Uh, uh, priests, bishops, and saints. And one of his one of his nephews came with him, Saint Mel, and said it was Saint Mel who, uh, in Irish parlance, uh, he was the one who gave uh, Saint Bridget a start. Uh, he was the one who recognised her and kind of brought her in, uh, even though there was many many other bishops who wouldn't have a woman in the church, but he did. Um, now, why did he come to Ireland? Well, he came to Ireland very, very simple. He came to Ireland to establish Roman authority on the church in Ireland because there was, um, not only was there a long Christian tradition in Ireland uh, going back hundreds of years before he arrived, but before he arrived, uh, there were lots of uh, Christians uh, had come to Ireland. Um, the Irish at uh, that time would need, need slaves. So they were raiding Britain and they were raiding uh, Gaul, which is, would be modern day France. And they were capturing slaves and bringing them back. Now, most of those slaves were Christians. Also, uh, around uh, the time that Patrick was a young man, uh, the Germanic tribes uh, set off. Uh, they were being pushed westwards uh, by, by, by groups coming in from the east. And they ended up uh, overrunning Western Europe. Um, and all of the Christians then who were in places like, uh, like France today were forced to move. Quite a number of those arrived in Ireland as asylum seekers and as refugees. Um, and uh, many of you may know that Ireland was known as the island of saints and scholars for about three centuries before the uh, Vikings arrived. Well, one of the reasons for that was because of the uh, the incoming skills and capital that uh, those uh, fleeing uh, Christians uh, brought uh, with them, and that gave rise to you know to huge developments. And Patrick, in his time, also gave rise to a, a, a building boom. Uh, he built something like seven hundred churches in twenty five years, uh, and around those churches there would have been you know uh, villages and other houses. So there was a, a building boom at that time. Um, so. His main target then uh, was the, the the Christians that were there, but he also decided that while he was here, sure, why not? Why not try and turn a few of the natives? So he did that. Now, uh, if any of you have seen, there was a movie made, uh, I think it was in 99 about him, and you see that he ran into trouble with the ecclesiastical authorities in Britain. There are two documents that he wrote. One was the Confessio, and the other was a letter to the soldiers of Caraticus. He wrote the letter to the soldiers of Caraticus uh, because Caraticus was a king, a British king, and Caraticus had raided uh, a village uh, on the northwest coast, northeast coast of Ireland, and he had kidnapped and taken away as slaves uh, a group of people that Patrick, uh, only a couple of days earlier, had baptized. So there was a lot of pressure on Patrick to do something about it. Um, and what he did was he wrote a letter to the soldiers of Caraticus, because Caraticus was, was a Christian and his soldiers were supposed to be Christian. And he was letting them know that the people that they had just taken were Christians that he had just baptized. And he was hoping that that would somehow help to gain their uh, liberty. Uh, problem was Patrick overstepped the mark. Uh, he should have contacted the bishops in England 
but he well he knew that uh, but he also knew that to to do that there were a couple of reasons why it wouldn't work. One was it would t- take too long because he knew uh, that within a week or two, most of those people would have been on the slave markets and distributed all over the world. Uh, also, he knew that Caratagus was probably the one who was providing uh, security uh, to the bishops in England. So there were two good reasons why they wouldn't help him. Problem then was <clears throat> the ecclesiastical authorities then took this as an affront and then they tried to remove Patrick from Ireland as a result of it. And when he was in his 70s, they sent, uh, they called him back for a review. Now, he knew that if he went back to England for a review in his early 70s, that he'd never get back to Ireland because he knew what they were trying to do. They wanted to take him out and replace him. So instead of going, he wrote a letter. That letter is the Confessio. And in that, uh, he defends his work in Ireland and he takes the he takes them on for the hypocrites that they were. So if you get a chance to read the Confessio, you can get it on online. It's, uh, and, and the letter to the soldiers of Caraticus that uh, gives you a good idea of, of what was going on. So as I said, the island of saints and scholars largely came about as a result of the influx uh, of Christians uh, with wealth and skills. And the work they did then was aided by the fact that Ireland was uh, on the outskirts of Europe. Uh, so it wasn't a place that was easily invaded, like a lot of European countries that just had land borders. That lasted then to the arrival of the Vikings. So the Viking period in Ireland, um, it's generally talked about as being 795 to 1014. Although in 1014, all all that happened was in 1014, the Irish defeated them militarily. Um, They didn't force all of the Vikings or the people who were second or third generation Vikings to leave. That wasn't the case. In fact, what they did was most of the Vikings that were in Dublin moved out to a place uh, outside of Dublin. If any of you heard of it, uh, called Ostman's Town or Oxman's Town as it's called now but at the time it was called Ostman O-S-T so it was the place of the Eastern man or the, the Vikings here's what the Irish taught of the uh, uh, of the Vikings the Irish annals called them sea vomitings from the north <clears throat> When uh, when when the monks were writing, uh, and they were because one of the main one of the main jobs that the monks had uh, in Ireland uh, was was writing was copying the manuscripts, and they had a habit of writing in you know in 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 in, in the you know beside beside the main text in the margins they would write some things and they usually would write in Irish. And even though they mightn't have thought a whole lot about it at the time, uh, this has given us uh, you know, great information about their ability in Irish, the quality of the Irish, the structure of the Irish and the rest. So this is what one of them wrote. Uh, the wind is rough tonight, tossing the white combed ocean. I need not dread fierce Vikings crossing the Irish sea. So the, the, the invasion began 795 or there, thereabouts. The first 25 years essentially were raids for slaves and mobile wealth. They would come into an area, grab whatever they could, and they would be gone before people could raise the alarm and come to the aid of those under attack. By the 830s, they had accumulated enough knowledge uh, of the Irish. They were even at the point where they could speak some of the language. They understood the geography, the political system, um, and they also uh, knew about the feuds and fighting that was going on among the Irish and they were able to take advantage of that. And also because of their skills with boats, uh, they were able to move inland. So from the 830s, they were able to move uh, up, up river. Uh, and they did that successfully for a number of years. Uh, then the first defeat for them came in the 840s when King Malachy um, set a trap for them. Uh, they were given Malachi a rough time. He was the high king at the time. And the uh, Tur- Turgesis, who was the head of the, the Vikings, he had arrived over to Ireland around 835, uh, declaring that uh, everybody who was in Ireland, uh, all of the, you know, the Vikings who were in Ireland at that stage had to pay homage to him and accept his leadership, um, which apparently they, they did because he could provide them with the security that they needed. So anyway, he took a liking to the daughter of Malachi and uh, wanted to marry her. Um, so Malachi apparently wasn't in a, a great position to, uh, to say no, but he wasn't going to say yes either. So what he did was, well, in fact, he did say yes. So he said, not only will I um, give you my daughter, 
but I will find uh, 19 of the nicest, the most beautiful girls in my clan for your commanders because a Turgesis had 19 uh, commanders. So anyway, there was an arrangement made. They were all going to have a feast and, uh, and the rest. So on the night anyway, the 19 uh, beautiful women uh, turned out to be some of Malachi's uh, uh, warriors. So at some point in the night when they were um, dividing up to go and meet their commander and do whatever they're going to do for the night, uh, they took off their wigs and displayed that they were men and killed uh, kill them all. Now, the thing about the Targises, at the time, there was an old tradition that you didn't spill royal blood. Uh, so they couldn't, they couldn't just kill them like that. So uh, Malachi took them and uh, drowned them in a, in a river. Anyway, so then uh, initially the, the, the Vikings were from, you know, were, were from one part of Scandinavia. Uh, now they started to come from other parts. So we got the Danes coming in around the 850s um, and they reasserted themselves over the next number of years. But uh, the Irish then rose up in the last uh, few years uh, of that century, partly as a result of the divisions internally with them. And they inflicted a massive defeat on them in 902. One result of that is that today in Iceland, um, there's huge numbers of people with um, Irish DNA uh, because the, by this stage, uh, the Vikings had made allies with uh, Irish you know, chieftains. So when they got when the Vikings got run out, so did uh, quite a few of the Irish, um, and some of those Irish would have intermarried with the Vikings. Uh, so there's a uh, there's proof of that uh, in 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 Iceland. Also, um, it was such a massive defeat for them, and uh, there was such an influx of people onto the island, onto Great Britain, onto the west coast of Britain, that again, that's all being mapped out through place names, uh, through burials. So there's a huge influx of people from from Ireland that were kicked out at that time, but. They returned 12 years later, and then they defeated a massive defeat on the Irish in 19, one which the Irish didn't recover from for about 60 years. Then they began to reorganize, and from the year 988 to 1014, they fought back. And then the final battle was on Good Friday, 1014, in Clontarf, uh, when Brian Baru uh, defeated them. And that essentially pacified the, uh, you know, the, the, the Vikings. Um, so they began paying tribute then to the Irish kings because now the old Irish chieftains were able to say, these Vikings have created these towns and cities and they're trading so we can get security money from them. So they were quite happy to leave them there and trade because apart from anything else, they were bringing in um, items like, I suppose, wine and uh, all sorts of things that the Irish chieftains needed. But they were also then buying up animals and various sort of things that were available on the Irish countryside. So it suited everybody. And that, so for the next 150 years, it was a renaissance. Quite a bit of it was to try to undo some of the damage that the Vikings had done because the Vikings had destroyed uh, Christian, you know, Christian buildings uh, had taken a lot of, uh, of some, some of the most beautiful pieces of jewellery that was ever created in Ireland, uh, illum Ill Ill illuminated books. Um, so they, you know, Irish people were sent all over the continent to try to recover a lot of stuff that had been taken out and it was all brought back to, to Ireland. Uh, then the next, next tragedy in the history of Irish people then was 1169 when soldiers from the neighboring island uh, arrived. Originally they came from, uh, from Wales, they were called Cambro Normans, and they began a campaign that essentially lasts to this day. Um, and the origin of the division of Ireland goes back that far. Now for the first 300 years, the Anglo-Normans as they were called, or Cambro Normans, uh, eventually the Cambro Normans were replaced by just people who were Angles. Uh, they tried unsuccessfully to subdue Ireland, although at one time they controlled about 75% of Ireland. And over time, the settlers, as they were, they became known as more Irish than the Irish themselves. Some of you may have referred to that. Now, that was a, a, something that was said of them by the English, not by the Irish, um, because the English hated them even more than they hated the Irish, because as far as they were concerned, these guys and ladies, they'd all gone native. 
Um, so the English were forced back over time, and to maintain rule then, they just controlled a small area called the Pale, uh, which was on the East Coast. Next big move then was when the Tudors came to power in 1485. They set out on a final reconquest of Ireland. To do that, they had to defeat the old Irish, or the old English. Now, there was at this stage, there was, uh, in fact, that old Irish there should read old English, um, because they were the original settlers. Um, and then, as soon as they had them sorted out, they wanted to move against the Irish clans. And they did that. The main uh, uh, old English clans were the Fitzgeralds, um, uh, Fitzmorrises, um, they were the ones who were always opposed to the crown. The butlers were always supporting the crown, but they needed to get rid of the Fitzgeralds and the Fitzmorrises, and they did that in the 1530s. They destroyed them. Uh, they, took, they set them up, um, got them to rebel. When they lost the rebellion, then they took everything from them. The first thing they did was they searched uh, out and uh, took all of the male line and... Uh, kill them so that there was no male line to go forward. And then they took all the land and titles uh, from them. Then after they had sorted out the old English, they went after the old Irish. Um, now Henry VIII then, he declared Ireland a kingdom and he forced the Irish chieftains to accept what was called surrender and regrant. In other words, come to me, surrender any title that you have a claim to at the moment, and I will give you a new title under my laws. And Unfortunately, quite a number of the uh, main Irish chieftains uh, accepted that deal. Probably a lot of them, because the Irish had been through so many cycles, you know, where uh, the English had done things and the Irish had managed to, you know, to take it back. So again, they probably thought, well, this is just another time and we'll, we'll get our land and everything else back, you know, in the next 40, 50 years. All it takes is a change of government in England or... Um, because there were there was two, if you like, opposing sides in England. Um, one of them was more pro-Irish than the other. So they, they, they would always expect that there would be some kind of a civil war in England. And if the result of that was a victory for the ones who were more pro-Irish, um, well, then maybe they would get their lands and titles back. Now, between Henry VIII and Elizabeth I, though, they succeeded in defeating the Irish and destroying the more than 3,000-year-old Celtic society by the early 17th century. Then, what the English uh, did then was they confiscated the whole province of Ulster and planted it with settlers. <clears throat> so the way they did that was um, the Irish had rebelled, and the, the leaders of the, uh, the old Celtic society had left Ireland. It's called in Irish history the Flight of the Earls. Now, the problem was when they fled or flew or whatever you want to say, they didn't ask for permission. And of course, in the fine print of those contracts that they had signed with Henry VIII way back, uh, there was a little clause that said, if you ever leave without getting permission, uh, you forfeit your titles and land. Um, so, so that was the first step. The English used that. But then what they did was they went to court and they got a judge to basically say that the... Um, the you know the, uh, the the treachery of the few um, is on you all. So they used they used that declaration by the court then to dispossess everybody because what they said was you know we know it wasn't just uh, your leaders that were involved we know that many of you were involved and they used that then to justify the expropriation from everybody apart from the ones that had sided with them. Then you had the rise of Puritanism and the English Civil War um, and the arrival of, of, of Cromwell uh, to Ireland in the 1640s. Now, <clears throat> the reason why the Cromwellian settlement was so disastrous for Ireland, because essentially Cromwell came in, uh, killed almost between a third and a half of the population through war, disease, famine. But he had to do that because he'd financed his war by issuing bonds repayable in land in Ireland. So when he won the Civil War, he, invited, he invaded Ireland to remove by force the Irish so that, um, and, and by this stage, uh, he had issued a bond so many times that they were all oversubscribed. So he had lots of people scrambling, you know, for their piece of land in Ireland. Um, so, <clears throat> he had, he, so he came to, to take the land, not, not just off the people in Ireland who had opposed him, but he took it from everybody. Now, those who had, had been... Uh, 
somewhat disposed to him. He gave them some land back, but it would have been poorer land and less. Um, so there was a lot of people died, but also upwards of 100,000 were transported to the colonies. And it's from that uh, period, you know, from the 1650s, that a lot of the Irish who ended up in places like Jamaica, Barbados, uh, various other, you know, parts of the, the West Indies, it's mostly from that time that they came. So the next stage one then was because the, the Reformation had taken root now and the Reformation was disastrous for Ireland. So, but at the beginning of the 17th century, the old Irish society, the old Celtic society has been, had been destroyed. But by the end of that century, the Irish and the Catholics had been destroyed because the, it wasn't just the Irish that remained Catholic. It was the old English as well who remained Catholic. The ones who were the new English, uh, who were of the Reformed Church, were the supporters of Elizabeth uh, and Henry and King William. So it all got sorted out anyway uh, in, in Ireland at the Battle of the Boyne, when two rival English kings fought for control of the three kingdoms of Ireland, Scotland and England. The Irish and the Catholic side lost, and at the Treaty of Limerick, over 40,000 Irish were removed in what uh, historically we know as the beginning of the flight of the wild geese. Uh, and over the next 50 years, almost half a million native and Catholic Irish left Ireland, primarily for France. Um, that, that was at a period when the, if you like, the Ulster Scots were coming to America. But traditionally at this point, uh, you know, people who are Catholic, they went to Europe. The penal laws then were introduced because with the Catholic, um, uh, Catholic Ireland defeated, it allowed the Protestant landed aristocracy to take over. And for about 100 and nearly 150 years, uh, there wasn't one uh, Catholic uh, who was allowed uh, to be part of the government from around 1660s until 18, the late 1820s. Effectively, they made being Catholic uh, illegal. So any act demonstrating your Irishness and you would include being a Catholic in that at that time, you were liable to punishment. Um, and that lasted until the late 18th century. Um, and with the rise of the French and American revolutions, things began to change. And Britain then was forced to make uh, some changes. And some of those changes were to restore some of the rights uh, to Catholics. Now, th there an Irish parliament was set up in 1297 by the Anglo-Irish when they came in, and it lasted until 1800 uh, when the British uh, when the British removed it. So it, it made all of the people who were elected in Ireland then go to London and sit at Westminster rather than sit at Dublin. That nearly destroyed Dublin because a, a great source of the you know wealth in Dublin was all of these people who were coming and going, um, and all the politicians and their troops and their big houses and, and, and whatever. Um, but also it meant that on a day-to-day -day basis, there was no one in Ireland underground who knew what was going on. Um, the first thing that happened was in order to get the Act of Union through, lots of promises were made, particularly to, to the Catholic Church, but they weren't kept. And one of the reasons why the Catholic Church accepted the Act of Union was because they were told that it was only a matter of going to be a matter of a, a few months possibly a few years and there would be catholic emancipation but they reneged on that and eventually there had to be a huge campaign which succeeded and by 1829 you did have catholic emancipation in other words uh catholic could vote uh, they could go to school they could get educated they could join the military and the professions now for almost 250 years at this stage the native irish economy <laughs> And society had been destroyed. And I'm talking about from around 1600, from the, uh, the time of the Ulster plantation, you know, through the Cromwellian periods, uh, through the years of the penal laws. So the massive destruction that in Ireland caused by the potato blight uh, is the direct effect of both the historic destruction of Irish society and the emergence in the 1840s of laissez-faire economics and providentialism. So at one level, the impositions of landlordism, that had created the basis for mass poverty and reliance because the landlords, the landlords weren't, weren't farmers. They were just people who were renting land out. And they, again, compared themselves to landlords in England and they wanted to have the same kind of standard of living. So to do that, they had to basically extract as much rent out of the Irish. 
And just to give you one example, um, if you were Irish and you rented some some place, if you did any improvements to it at all, your rent went up, or uh, which meant sometimes that you couldn't get it because maybe the rent went up so much that you couldn't buy it. But there was always people who were a little bit better off than you who might take it. And that was a horrible uh, imposition on the Irish. The, the, the main impact on that was that people did not improve. And then, of course, the English would come along and say, oh, look at these people. They live, you know, they live like pigs. They, you know, the reality was you couldn't improve. If you did, you were going to lose your house. Then we had laissez-faire economics, a preached against state intervention. Can you imagine today with this virus, if the government here said, you're all on your own, there's going to be no 600 a week for, for you, there's going to be no recognition for, um, you know, for people who are in the gig economy, you're all going to have to find a way or, or else you're going to have to starve. I mean, that's basically what laissez-faire economics did. There was going to be no state intervention. And then, of course, on top of that, you had providentialism. The providentialism was basically uh, a doctrine that was very strong at the time, uh, and it was used to say that this was God's judgment on the Irish. And then the next step above that then was, well, who are we to intervene in God's judgment? If God has made this judgment, we would be wrong to go and help them. So take it from there. So the famine effects, well, the famine in many ways completed the destruction of Irish society that had been going on for centuries. Deaths and emigration saw upwards of 3 million Irish people removed. The Irish language was destroyed. The rural Irish economy, which was um, one that was based on, uh, I suppose, a, a communitarianism, communitarianism, you know, where people lived in villages and worked a land in a style that was something that, you know, related back, you know, to the old Celtic society. That was something the English hated because the English wanted everybody on their own, in their own house, separated from everybody else on their own bit of land. They didn't want people coming together in the evening and dancing and drinking and singing and telling their kids about, you know, the old stories and teaching them their history. Uh, so they were so happy now that all of those communities were destroyed. Um, so now emigration would bleed the countryside dry because by this stage and for, you know, for the 40, 50 years before the famine, there have been all sorts of schemes to try to get people off the land in Ireland because the land owners wanted to bring in cattle and sheep. They wanted to get the people off the land. At one stage, the English were debating a scheme where they were going to send 3 million Irish people to Northwestern Canada. Didn't happen, but they, they tried it. Uh, the other thing we know is that 7 million Irish emigrated from 1620 to 1920. The highest population Ireland has ever had was 8 million, and that was in 1840, before the famine. But anyway, and at, at this stage, British communiques then were expressing confidence that the Irish were finished. There would be no more rebellions. And they were all heading for America, where the English gleefully predicted the unfaithful and ungrateful deserter settlers would be overwhelmed by the teeming, stinking masses of poverty-stricken Irish. That was the way they looked at it. Um, this, was, this was going to be, you know, their, uh, their, you know, you wanted your freedom, well, now you deal with this. What the Irish did was they discovered a new word, the word rising, and it was a more positive term than that was found in rebellion. So the rural Irish rose first, and by the start of the 20th century, the British government had to bail out the landlords and probably one of the biggest bailouts in history because the, the issue at this stage was that the Irish uh, were rebelling um, and had made uh, life so difficult for landlords uh, that the landlords wanted out, uh, but they wanted, they wanted to be able to sell their land, and the Irish didn't see any reason why they should pay them because this, after all, was land that their ancestors had had that was taken. So the Irish attitude was, you know, okay, you don't like it here any longer? Well, go. We'll take the land. But, of course, the British didn't want to do that. So they put up a fund to allow the Irish to buy the land off their landlords, and then the Irish would have to continue then to pay uh, that money back. Um, so 
one way or another anyway, the land was back in Irish hands after 700 years. Um, now, also from the 1880s, the rising Gaelic movements in language, art, sport, theatre, uh, it, it strove to show people that there was a time when Irish people controlled their own country and they performed activities that were Irish and spoke their own language. So it was a magnificent movement that was intended to de-Anglicise the Irish to remind people of their history uh, and to reintroduce them uh, to all the old stories, try to get people back um, doing the things that were recognizably Irish. Because the argument was that without that, you never be Irish. You know, speaking English, uh, dressing like the English, talking like the English, pretending to be English is not going to amount to being Irish. So... Easter 16, then, was the culmination of that radical movement for Irish independence. Uh, and as it turned out, uh, it started off on Easter Monday, uh, a day in, in Ireland still where people go to the races in Fairy House. Um, and that day, the English rulers were out enjoying the horse races when the rebellion began. Now, despite the execution of the leaders and the imprisonment of thousands, uh, the English couldn't put the rising down. Uh, after uh, three or four years, uh, Sinn Féin uh, became the party for everybody looking for independence and for separation from Britain. And in the elections in 1918, uh, Sinn Féin were returned um, and controlled about 90% of the, countries, of the country. And then they formed in 1919. They, well, they went up, uh, on their main platform on the election was that if you vote for us, we will uh, have an assembly here in Dublin and we will establish an Irish Republic uh, with its own elected government. And that's what they did. The British wouldn't recognize that. They refused to grant legitimacy uh, and therefore the, the war of independence began. It continued for a few years and then we had the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1922. And that signified an end to uh, the civil war, but it came at a huge cost. Uh, a civil war in Ireland and partition of Ireland. And those who supported the treaty formed the Irish Free State and those who opposed it uh, continued the tradition of the Republic. So the treaty then cemented partition. Six counties of Ulster now had a unionist dominated government that would use discrimination, gerrymandering, special powers, to ensure majority rule by one community over the, the other, over the minority. And that continued into the 60s. And by, end of, by the end of the 60s, war had broken out. And that would continue to last for 30 years until the Belfast Good Friday Agreement in 1998. So today, well, Brexit and the connection with Great Britain continues to threaten the future of Ireland. Because all this is in Ireland, it is, it is, it is there, you know, Britain, Great Britain could have left, no problem. They could have left Europe at any time, only for the fact that they were hanging on to a part of Ireland, because that was the problem. If they wanted to continue holding on to that part of Ireland, which had a land border with a part of what was now the European Union, uh, well, then there was going to be issues. If they were going to you know, put, put um, border posts up, well, then that would invite a restart of violence in Ireland and the war, which Europe didn't want. Um, so again, uh, that problem that arose from the beginning in 1169, when the English came in, uh, continues to today. And even though we have the 1998 agreement, which commits the British government in good faith uh, to try to help the situation along, whereby at some point in the future, Ireland will be united. Uh, any future government in Britain could turn around and say, well, oh, that was then, you know, now I, we don't agree with that. So we, there's no guarantees that Britain will live up to its promises as we go into the future. But things have changed. You know, politics now has come full circle in 100 years. Uh, today, for the first time in the six counties, nationalist politicians are in the majority even though the nationalist population is still a, you know, a minority, but nationalist politicians are in the majority for the first time. And in the south of Ireland, Sinn Féin are back again as the largest political party in Ireland. Not uh, comparatively speaking in a similar situation that they were in 1919, um, but uh, it's something that 20 years ago 
uh, no one would have put odds on that happening. I hope that um, gave you some understanding, you know, where we are in Ireland, where we've come from, what we've been through. Thank you, Sean. That was wonderful. You have gotten a lot of uh, adulation and applause from everybody who's been watching this on YouTube. Um, there are a few questions. Um, so th there's been a handful, and I will try to watch the stream, but now it's, it's, fly it's, it's filling with a ton of adulation uh, and appreciation for your work, Sean. So I'm going to take some questions that I wrote down earlier, um, and you can kind of choose. Starting, I think I'll start at the very beginning. Um, when you started talking about the, the clans, there was a slide that you had several clans listed and the time frame is for them. Yes. Is, there, is there an idea about where those clans came from um, before they, you know, where, you know where, did they, where did they come from before they came to Ireland? Yes, um, they, they came from, um, now some of them are, are, are interrelated. Uh, the, 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 the first ones that arrived uh, probably came from Egypt, Wow. The Fomorians, we think, may have come from uh, Algeria. Um, the, um, you know, uh, then a number of others probably came, you know, uh, probably from Central, Central Europe, uh, probably again Greece and Scythia. Uh, and then the last one, the Malaysians had taken over Spain, you know, so their, their jumping off point was for Ireland was, was Spain from Galicia. Um, now this is again. Uh, this is the history that's in the, the you know the the the, the book of um, book of invasions, and it relates to a lot of the folklore. So I tell you now, you can go out there tomorrow and buy a history uh, book that says history of Ireland, and it'll tell you a totally different story than what I told you. There's people out there who want to tell you a different story. Uh, there are people out there who want the story to essentially be that anything that's in Ireland came from England and that, uh, you know, to get to Ireland it had to come through England, whatever it be. Uh, and unfortunately, because of the strength of the Anglo-Irish tradition in, in Ireland, there are lots of people writing history in Ireland uh, who essentially will not accept the, the, the old Irish history because a lot of it is word of mouth. A lot of it is from the oral tradition. A lot of it is folklore. And they say, well, I'm a scientist. I, I can't accept that, you know, unless I can see a genuine piece of evidence that uh, tells me. And of course, you know, before the literary, you know, the, the, well, part of the problem was, you know, there, were lit there was literary work there. But unfortunately, St. Patrick uh, burned, I think, something like 150 volumes uh, of books that the Druids had, just like the church everywhere it went to. You know, the first thing it did, it ordered people to come in, you know, with all of their written works and burnt them all because they understood the importance of getting rid of your history. Uh, so, you know, so we, but, you know, you, you like, for instance, um, in Ireland, you can go down to, to Kerry, you know, and there's a plain there called the Plain of Scotia. And that's called after the, uh, the wife of the, the, the leader of the, the Celts that came in. You know, you go all over the country and there's, you know, bits and pieces. Now, what I'm hoping is over the next 100, 200 years that scholars will be able to unearth an awful lot more, you know, because even in terms of archaeology, we're really in the first one or two generations of native archaeologists, you know, who yeah. understand the importance of going carefully through whatever is there. You know, we've had experience of archaeologists coming in and destroying stuff. Anyway, take another question. So that's a great, there's a good segue from that to another question, which was, what books would you recommend people read? You had a great statement here to be wary of, of some of the, the history books out there, but I'm sure you gained your knowledge from a wide variety of sources. What should people, if who want to dive in next, what should, where would you direct them? Okay, well, there's, uh, let me just see. I got a um, couple here. This one here is very good. Uh, the Origins of the Irish. That's a, an excellent book. Uh, uh, the Story of the Irish Race. A very, very good book. Um, <laughs> this one here, it's a very old book. This was written in the, uh, this was written in the 1760s, 1770s. It's, um, it's Sylvester O'Halloran's uh, History of, of, of Ireland. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, there was, 
there's another, uh, so he, 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 Sylvester Halloran, History of Ireland, he relies a lot on the, uh, all of the old, you know, works that were there. And he, he basically, he, he basically wrote it uh, to undermine and to take to task the Anglo, uh, the Anglo-Irish historians. What he was basically saying is, okay, you've got away with it for so, so long, you know, you, 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 you're disregarding or you're undermining, you know, the ancient traditions of this country, which are nonsense, you know, and this he wrote. Now, it took him something like 25 years to get it printed because nobody would print it, you know, uh, because they didn't want to see it, you know, even at that stage. Now, there was another book called On Forest Fassa, uh, which was written by a fellow called Keating uh, a couple of centuries before this, uh, which again relies heavily on old manuscripts, many of which, you know, have, have been lost over time. But we know of them because they're referred to in other works. There's a couple other questions that we want to get to. I know that the night is getting long and I don't want to keep people too late. I don't want to keep you too late. Um, but there are, uh, there's an interest in... Um, oh, well, somebody was interested in your take on how the Irish saved civilization uh, and what you think about that book. So I don't know if you'd like to say a couple words about that book. I know that's quite a popular work. It is, yeah, yeah. No, I, I would recommend everybody to read that book. Oh. You know, Great. It has its detractors, uh, you know, in the sense there are people who would say it's uh, one of the things that a lot of people who um, who don't like, you know, the who don't like to recognize the old history of Ireland um, and they don't want to come across as if they're insulting. So they use words like it's too romantic or it's, you know. <laughs> um, so uh, that, that kind of nonsense. No, he's, he's, his point is, is key. Basically what he said was that at that time, and we know it, uh, and, and the course I do in that period, you know, I use his book a lot. Um, you know, a, a lot of works came, you know, uh, from the continent and the, 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 you know, the German tribes would have destroyed them all. The pagans would have destroyed them all. Um, so they, they brought over books from Greece, from Rome, and they transcribed them. Um, and they did it at a time when the, when the Roman church was totally opposed to them doing it. You know, the Roman church at the time was basically saying, you know, these, the, these ancient Greek works, are the work of pagans, they're scandalous. You know, why are you wasting your time on these? But the Irish stood up for scholarship, you know, and that was so important. We could have lost so much if it wasn't for the work that they did at the time. Um, one final question that I have, there's, I'm not going to have time to get to everything that people have asked, um, but there was, there was uh, some comment as you were going through that seemed like this is a history of a lot of wars, and a lot of history is written as, as a history of wars and, and conflict, but I know that you also are a great historian of Irish culture, and Irish culture is a lot deeper than just the stereotypical fighting Irish, that there is such great um, history and song and in, you know, with people coming together for so many you know, hundreds and thousands of years. So I wonder if you could say something about, um, you know, just to help people appreciate the kind of the richer depth and just a chronicle of, of battles, which is obviously very significant, but, and I don't mean to diminish all the blood that's been shed, but there is so much more to the Irish experience too. Oh, there is, but you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, there's no doubt, there's no doubt that um, the, uh, the, you know, the, the wars on Ireland have had devastating, you know, uh, effects. Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, um, you know, if we even take the Vikings, you know, if the Irish had been able to unify, the Vikings would never have got a foothold in Ireland. You know, but the Vikings used the Irish. They would, they would side with one group of Irish against another, and then the Irish would do the same. You know, the Irish would hire some Vikings to come in and to try to finish off uh, the neighbor up the road. <laughs> so it was, it was not, it was not, it was not good. You know, um, the the other side of it was that uh, at that, you know, going back there, every community had to be capable of defending itself. You know, so people had to be brought up uh, with the skills, you know, of fighting, because you never knew, you never knew when you were going to be called upon. Uh, so there were, a lot of them were what you would call warrior societies. And that was partly to do with the reality. Uh, you know, if you are perceived as not being capable of defending yourself, well, then somebody was just going to walk in and take it all from you. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's one of those issues that goes back to, to morality and the nature of the human being. You know, uh, you know why we are so 
uh, why, why we're so predisposed, you know, to, uh, to doing this kind of thing. But that's a, a big philosophical issue. Uh, and, you know, the Irish won't take blame for that. But certainly they participated as much as anybody else. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I would encourage everybody who didn't make it to the one that we did two weeks ago about Brexit and the implications for Ireland, they can go and watch that recording uh, here on YouTube. Uh, they can look for links. They can go out to our website now and see the program for that. Um, do you have any final words you'd like to leave us with? There's, there's been a lot of comments and, and there's been, they, people keep uh, a lot of, you know, giving you compliments, thanking you, thanking you for saying how good it was, uh, how much they enjoyed this presentation, Sean. So thank you so much. There's a lot of Irish pride tonight. Okay. Well, what I would like, you know, uh, I don't know how I'm going to do it because I don't have a website. Of, I don't have any way directly of connecting with, you know, with people. But when there's so many people there, uh, you know, I would love to be able to you know, have a way you know the connections with people um so the two main places that i'm you know that that you can kind of link up you know one is directly with me but then there's uh, i work with the irish um uh, the irish cultural center of new england mm -hmm. and i work with the cultural center of cape cod and you can register my courses with them or you can register directly you know with me if you can find me Thank you, Sean. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the live stream. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, you can come back to YouTube and watch us again. Come back to the, the website. Uh, you can simply find us at thomascranelibrary.org. And um, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you.